Welcome to Generation. It's that time of the week to meet an inspiring young Mongolian. Enjoy the show. August in Mongolia is typically very rainy, and no one likes to flood the streets in Ulaanbaatar. Even though children in Mongolia do love to learn to swim during the summer, there are public swimming pools and training centers in each city district that offer swimming lessons. Hey, everybody! Uh, my name is Tolga. I work as a foreign affairs expert on the Mars V project. Well, a uh, normal day for me, especially this morning, I started off with a little calisthenics. I uh, came to the swimming pool, did a little cardio in the water. Since I do believe that uh, keeping the body healthy through swimming is very important. And uh, one of my favorite uh, cartoon characters said, uh, Dory uh, is uh, keep on swimming. Uh, I want to thank everyone here for uh, watching the MNB Smart uh, Generation. Uh, today is a really important and busy day. We'll be visiting uh, some of the space sectors in Mongolia, and we'll be reaching the Gobi. So I hope you stick around. Thank you. From a swimming pool to an exhibition of dinosaur fossils found in the Mongolian Gobi, what an interesting day! Why are we in the Mongolian Dinosaur Museum? While a lot of people might see the Gobi Desert as, in a way, just a barren area, a landmass of sand, but as you can see, the Gobi Desert, especially the Mongolian Gobi, has a lot of riches both above and under. For example, the Sorolophus found in Umunro is one of the few dinosaur species found in the world, meaning that a lot of unfound uh, dinosaur remains are still in the Gobi Desert, still to be found. It does attract a lot of tourism in regards to remains of dinosaurs, dinosaur skeletons, and uh, a lot of people also come to see the stars uh, due to uh, their hobbies in astronomy. How is the Mongolian Gobi connected to astronomy and space? With this being said of how the Mongolian Gobi is so rich in atmosphere, uh, temperature and its relations to space and even our past, the Mars V project is attempting to connect Mongolians now to the future which is the space industry. The Mars V project is creating comprehensive Mars analog simulation stations in the Gobi deserts to provide technological advancements for all humankind and to increase tourism to Mongolia in general. So essentially our motto is Mars is for everyone. How does the Mongolian Gobi resemble Mars? The temperature on Mars reaches from negative 80 Celsius to positive Celsius and their soil composition is red made of ferrum O2, which is a form of rust. That's why it, the Mars planet gives off a red color. The Mongolian Gobi especially is one of the biggest cold deserts in the world, closest to the equator, which means it can provide temperatures from negative 40 Celsius to positive 40 Celsius, the closest environment and atmosphere to that of Mars. What's your personal experience with the Mongolian Gobi? Yeah, we've been to the mostly Umunro provinces. And if you actually go there, pictures do not paint the full picture. If you go there, look at the Gobi deserts with your naked eye. It's absolutely astonishing. The atmosphere, the environment, it all makes you feel like you're almost on another planet, like you're on Mars, essentially, uh, whether it's uh, winter or summer, spring, fall, it's absolutely astonishing. It truly feels like an out-of-body experience. Mongolia has many museums. The first museum in Mongolia was established in 1923. 
The Dinosaur Museum is the one of the youngest museums in Mongolia, established in 2013, to welcome the arrival of a repatriated Tarbazaurus Batar skeleton. You can visit the museum with the purchase of a ticket that only costs 3,000 Mongolian tuturks. So I've been working on the Mars V project for about almost a year now. Uh, we're about to go in and check out our office. So let's see what the project is all about. Hey everyone, welcome to the office of the Mars V project. This is essentially where the magic happens. If you take a look into this wall right here, we do have a lot of paintings. Uh, Mr. Bat Bilik, one of the greatest artists in Mongolia right now. Um, the three big paintings that we do have here depict the Mongolian Gobi. Uh, Mr. Bat Bilik, uh, when he went to the Mongolian Gobi, to the Hirmenzhou area, he looked at the environment that the Gobi provides us and he told us that it really did make him feel like he was on another world. If we take a look here, um, this is one of the suits that Mr. Gurarkcha wore. Uh, this is one of the A copies. There are only two A copies right now. Uh, the original space suit is currently in the Russian museums in Russia. Gurarkcha Jukdirdimit is the first Mongolian and 102nd person in the world to experience space flight. When he was 34, he and Soviet cosmonaut Vladimir Janibeko departed from Earth on March 22, 1981, and spent seven days in space, orbiting Earth 124 times. Later, he was awarded a hero title from the both countries. Also, another fun fact, Mr. Gurarkcha, the one of the only Mongolians to have entered space, is also a member of the Mars V Team project. He's currently working as a advisor to the project. He's usually working on how um, astronauts are trained and astronauts or astronaut work is conducted. So if we took a look at this wall, we like to celebrate the members of the uh, Mars V Team. We have over 200 permanent members. And another fun note, we also have over 4,000 individuals who have signed up to become volunteer workers. Uh, here's me right over here. <laughs> um, here is one of our um, pre-visibility study team leads. She's one of my bosses. <laughs> and if you come right this way, um, we do have a 3D printed structure of what the Mars V project is trying to accomplish in the Gobi deserts. Um, essential training bases for people, individuals, professionals alike to go to Mars, a area for tourism, and a technology development free zone. Thank you for giving us a tour of the Mars V project office. What are your daily duties here? Uh, the Mars V project has made a lot of leaping in the sense of space and uh, progress. We have officially introduced the project to Mr. Donald Trump, uh, Jim Bridenstine, the administrator of NASA, uh, JAXA, ISRO, Roscosmos. Um, due to that, uh, with that, the Mars V project is officially members of uh, two NASA working groups. Uh, one of our, one of my main jobs is to keep stable contact with uh, our partners. For example, I'm basic. I'm one of the people who are in charge of sending the emails to NASA uh, if they need information from us. Uh, I'm the I'm the person they usually contact with uh, two more people. Um, recently, um, we have officially made contact with Alyssa Carson. Uh, one of the official people who are to go to Mars 
Uh, she's currently 19. She should be leaving for Mars in, within five years. And we've officially invited her to come uh, meet with the team members, get introduced to the Mars V project. We have also in, extended an invitation to make Alyssa Carson an honorary member of the Mars V project, which she has accepted. Tell us more about your background. I grew up in a diplomat family. My father was a defense attaché in many places. Uh, due to that, we were able to go and live in the United States for a bit. Um, we used to travel a lot. We went first went to the U.S. to live there when I was around two and three. So English was more of a natural language to me. Did you want to be a diplomat? I finished high school in the States. Uh, I went to the Winston Churchill High School. Uh, I was there for, uh, I was there in college for about a year and a half. Uh, but I came here to finish my studies. Uh, since my family is uh, mostly in the forms of diplomats. Uh, my plan at the time was to come here, uh, finish my military service, and finish uh, my bachelor's here. And at the time, I was planning on also uh, working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Have you had some professional experience with diplomacy? Worked uh, at, in New York, uh, to the Mongolian, uh, at the Mongolian mission to the United Nations from, for about five years during the UN high level events, um, which did teach me a lot of um, how governments, well, not governments, but um, diplomats work or uh, what the process at the UN is, how paperwork works, how uh, bilateral and uh, bilateral relations works and uh, multilateral relations work, which was, in a way, a very much an eye-opener for me. Why did you choose to work for this space project instead of following your dream of being a diplomat? So, um, a lot of people in the world don't really have a full understanding of where or what country Mongolia is. And yeah, our history is in a way um, crystal clear. But the current situation or the current status is of Mongolia is unknown to most parts of the world. The Mars V project is trying to change that. When people think about Mongolia, let's make them think about Mars. Let's think about, make them think about the space sector, uh, scientific development, a global center for tourism. That's what the Mars V project is trying to do. Um, so let's head out. We're going to go to space in a way. Mongolians, as the people of a nomadic nation, have always observed the night sky on a daily basis to predict the weather. There are many works of literature that also talk about space exploration. One of them is the poem Star, written 90 years ago by the great poet Matzak Dorch Dashtorch about Mars. Do you know about our universe or not? How strong are the flames of love and affection? Why do you never send letters to our universe? Esteemed wise Mars, you see all things at once. Why this place is important to you? We right now are at the Dudu Children's Museum. We are standing right next to the uh, Mongolian space station MGL. Um, this is a place where the youth, usually children, can come, uh, enjoy the playgrounds, the playing area. There's uh, scientific areas for uh, development for kids. Um, as you can see here, this is one of the, a lot of people can bring their kids, their brothers, their sisters, cousins and essentially increase their knowledge of uh, the space or like uh, the, what space stations are or how space stations operate. And it's very interesting if you actually come here and take a look. How did you connect to space when you were a child? As you start growing up and when you're in love with the aspect of space, space travel, you see these like movies, cartoons like Star Wars, Star Trek, 
and even certain things like Duck Dodgers has an episode where they're going into space. It's quite, it fills a dream in you and it definitely did it with me and when you're growing up you're starting to learn more and more about space and after maybe the 60s or the 70s and 80s you start to learn that these space industries are becoming more and more privatized every day giving individuals opportunities to essentially take a part in these giant leaps in uh, mankind's history. So that was one of the motivations for me to uh, start working in what I like to call a space sector. Since you work on a space project that is connected to international organizations, can you tell us what's new and interesting about what's happening up there? Uh, ever since I started working on the Mars View project, you get, since I'm working more on the side of foreign relations, I do a lot of research on the private sectors. For example, there's companies in uh, the U.S., Sierra Nevada, that's making space taxis. So individuals can just go in these, hop in these space taxis, take a ride into the International Space Station, which is quite mind-boggling and astonishing. There's space tourism is starting to become a, such a big industry where people are planning to not only go to Mars, but uh, trips around the moon. Hotels in uh, lower space are being developed. Elevators that can reach the ISS. It's, it's amazing what people and in these industries, and especially space, are doing these days. How does your job connect to the profession you went to university for? We do a lot of video conferences with the international organizations, the national organizations in space, for example, the NASA, JAXA, ESO, Roscosmos. So, um, we do have online meetings <clears throat> with the two NASA working groups about one to two times a month. So the more diplomatic part comes in, so you're presenting yourself in a different way. It's official business in a way. So I like to think I'm doing some sort of diplomatic work <laughs> in a way. How do you see the future of your work? Mongolia might be landlocked and we don't have access to sea, but we do have access to space. And I'm truly honored to be taking a part in this project and in this process. Today, mankind wants to put the first human on the red planet by 2031. In the more immediate future, Mongolia wants to become a popular destination for tourists who want to experience what life on Mars could be like. Our guest, Tolak Botbat, is working to make space dreams come true. Thank you for sharing your day with us, Tolak. See you next time.